Um, thank you for joining us. And we're going to talk about relieving pain in uh, teens and active adults. I'm Dr. Maidan from the CUE Preservation Service. So the first thing, um, every good visit needs to start with uh, history, the story from the patient, and a good exam. And this is the only way we can try and figure out if the pain that actually uh, the patient reports on comes from the hip joint or from other mimickers. The hip and pelvis is very complicated anatomical region. And there's many times that we think that the pain comes from one spot, but it actually comes from a different one. And that's why we need a very good physical exam. And it's very important to exclude the spine as a source of pain. Now, when we do the exam, we have to start with the walking gates. We have to see the patients moving, and then we have to assess, as we said, the spine itself. And we move to the lower limbs range of motion. We have to assess the version and the torsion. We're gonna to talk a little bit about it later on so we can understand that on imaging. Then we move to the provocative maneuvers to see if we move the patient in a way that causes pain and why and where. We have to assess, as we said, everything around the pubic, the groin, the adductors and the abductors, the hamstrings, the piriformis and the hip flexor or the iliopsoas. You can see here a normal template that we usually run in clinic when we um, examine a patient. We start with a spinal exam, as we said, we move to the full range of motion. The range of motion needs to be done both supine, prone and sides so we can assess every side of the hip joint. You can see the provocative maneuvers, the Faber and the failure or the flexion adduction internal rotation test. These are the most common one that we are using when we are assessing someone for hip pain. When we are done with the physical exam, we move to the radiographic diagnosis and shed a bit more light on what's happening within the patient with regards to the anatomy. We're using a lateral center edge. It's very, very important, especially in dysplasia. And the social angles shows us if the head is about to sublux or to slide out of the joint because the roof is not completely horizontal, but more oblique. But it's first very important that many patients that come to see us are being asked to do a good x-ray because sometimes they've done x-ray elsewhere and we know the x-ray is a bit rotated and tilted. And I want to explain why is it so important. So this is a pelvis from plastic that we used wires in order to delineate, delineate the anterior and posterior wall of the pelvis. And you can see here that the x-ray is very symmetric. It's not tilted and rotated. However, when we tilt the x-ray forward, we get uh, a pseudo effect of pincer impingement, meaning that there is more crossover signs in both sides. And if we rotate the pelvis, meaning if the x-ray was not done correctly and the patient was standing a little bit rotated to either side, then we can think that one side is more open and the other side is more closed. And this closed side is the one that we usually gonna trim down some bone during surgery. So obviously we don't wanna do the wrong surgery just because the patient did not get the correct x-ray. So it's very important to get the first x-ray before everything else. Once we have the correct and the perfect x-ray, then we can run a lot of the try and evaluate the tools in order to assess what's going on within the patient pelvis. Now, regardless of what's going on, the end point of most problems within the hip and pelvis would be osteoarthritis. We see that the cartilage starts to die and we get to the point where we can say the patient is bone on bone. You can see here on the left side, when there's a lot of cystic changes within the joint after the cartilage was completely delaminated and degenerated. And the, obviously the end point after that would be either hip resurfacing or hip replacement. You can see a patient over here that in 2018 had a good joint space is marked here. Um, a patient that had a 2018 an x-ray with a good joint space, but a few years later, without any correction, um, he has a bone on bone anatomy, which as we said, would require a hip replacement. And this is where the hip preservation comes into play. So the first anatomy, um, anatomical uh, and pathology that we're talking about would be the femoral acetabular impingement or FAI. The most common part of the FAI would be cam impingement. And we basically then talking about an excess of bone that grew usually during adolescent life and turned the head um, into more like an egg shaped as opposed to a nice uh, round ball. When we have an excess bone like that or a bony bump like that, we cannot really fit that structure within the hip socket when we flex our hip. And that's why usually the pain would happen when we go into deep flexion or internal rotation of the pelvis. You can see it here. We tend to measure that with uh, an angle that's called the alpha angle that shows us that part of bone that is not part of the normal head that again, the grew accidentally 
earlier in life, and this is the part that we'll need to remove later on in surgery. The cam lesion is usually very destructive. It usually causes failure in the front part and the side part of the hip. Unfortunately, because most people have significant, enough, um, a significant part of muscle volume around the hip joint, they tend to um, mimic other areas. And many times we do not feel actually the pain that happens inside. It's like a ticking bump. The labrum tend to fail late in this case. You can see that we also can see that cam impingement, that excess bone on the MRI. Afterwards, if we do not treat that, then it causes labral tear, and you can see that labral tear here down with the um, red arrow. When we'll have to correct the cam lesion and remove all that excess bone, we'll have to go outside of that yellow line towards the normal part, away from the normal part towards the area where you have excess bone that we need to remove. Now, the second type is pincer type impingement. And in that um, pathology, we're talking about a socket that it's a bit too deep. It doesn't really fit the head well inside. That usually develops a bit slower, but it affects the cartilage globally as opposed to the cam lesion, which is usually a small part of the socket in the front that is getting damaged um, and turned into a flap or a carpet. The labrum is usually much smaller and it tends to, to become ossified over time, but the pain as opposed to the cam impingement present usually much earlier in life. However, many patients have what we call mixed type impingement, which is a combination of both the cam lesion and the pincer impingement. In that respect, we have to remove that piece of pincer bone and turn that initial red line into that line where the line do not cross each other, meaning the front and the back of the hip are aligned well, and we have what we call good version. You can see at the bottom, the both pathologies, the cam impingement and the pincer impingement. They are basically the different sides of the equation, but they both cause the same type of pain. So many times patients come to us and they say, I tried physical therapy, I tried massage it, I've seen my chiropractor, I rested, tried non-steroidal, but nothing helps. If I rest, sometimes the pain goes away for a little bit. The second I go back skiing, I go back running, I have pain again. And then they tell us, they, uh, my primary care, my PT told me that I have labral tear on the MRI. That's how a labral tear looks on the MRI. You see the triangle of uh, the labrum itself and the arrow itself uh, shows us where the fluid, the white part goes between the labrum and the bone. This is the tear. So do we have to fix any one of these tears? you can see that not. There is a lot of patients walking out there that are completely asymptomatic. They have no pain, but they do have labral tear on in, as an incidental finding on an MRI. Sometimes go to the, sometimes patients go and have an MRI because they have an abdominal issue and the radiologists pick up an MRI that has um, a labral tear on it, but we don't have to fix it. We don't fix every labral tear. However, when we do have a labral tear, we need to understand where it comes, where it comes from it and why. I usually tend to use the metaphor that the labrum, it's like if the fever of the joint. If someone goes to the emergency department and tells the ED physician that they have fever, the ED physician try to figure out if the fever comes because they have cancer, because they have urine tract infection, or because they have pneumonia. We do not treat all of these different pathologies the same way, right? We would not treat cancer the same way we're going to treat an infection. And that's the same with labral tear. Almost every pathology that happens in the hip joint end up as a labral tear. It can be impingement, dysplasia, chondromatosis, autoimmune diseases. So fixing the labrum, the labral tear by itself would not fix the problem unless we are fixing the pathology that caused the tear to begin with. After we get into the joint, we first have to remove the cam lesion, as we said, and you can see here the before, that big bony bump, and you can see how it looks afterward when we carve the, the bone nicely, and now it can fit into the hip socket once we flex our hip, and you can see the intraoperative pictures. You can see another example, the cam lesion before and the cam lesion afterwards. So basically, we're re-sculpturing the femoral head. We do the same thing when we have pincer impingement, when we have too much bone on the socket side. You can do the before and you can do, you can see the after, after we move that bone. And that's how the labrum looks when we repair it. You can see that um, blue string of the anchor that we put into that stabular socket in order to fix the labrum to its place. You can see the tear, you can see the labrum repair.
that's how it looks when we do one while we do it during surgery so we drill that um anchor under the labrum and then we use these small strings they are very very small very very thin and we run them through the labrum itself once we run these two strings through the labrum we can tie them down and that knot that we're going to cut from we're going to do from outside of the hip joint you can see here several examples of that several anchors at the same time these knots going to push the labrum back towards the rim where it's supposed to sit and then it would heal obviously it would not heal unless we fix the cam or the pincer or the dysplasia or the original reason that caused the labrum to tear in the first place and you can see how the uh, bone can move nicely under and you can imagine if there was a bony bump over here that would not fit under the labrum and cause a tear sometimes there's different bony calcifications in the labrum itself and when we pull this bone out the labrum is not viable anymore to repair or sometimes we just have to revise a different surgery and the labrum uh, the tissue of the labrum is not in a good quality to repair it in these cases we have to prepare um, and we do it ad hoc we are prepared for it in every case we take a cadaver tissue usually an itb allograft and we turn into a labrum we call it label reconstruction so you can see here how we rolled it we tied it and now we pull it into the joint with these two strings you can see it hold it in both sides and you can see how it looks nicely inside afterward as a reconstruction about five to seven percent of the patient that have surgery end up needing that but definitely not everybody it's, it's something we do relatively rarely now we also have to deal with the cartilage damage that we see during hypertroscopy and when we get inside we usually tend to see two different kind of flaps we're going to talk about these flaps a bit a, bit, a little bit later one of them would correspond more with impingement the other one with dysplasia that's how they look inside so one of them would peel from the labrum towards the center of the hip joint and one of them would uh, fold from the center of the hip joint outside because of the different mechanism that happens regardless of the fact once we see an unstable cartilage as you can see over here on the left we have to remove that part of the cartilage because we cannot glue it back it's a dead cartilage at that point and then we basically drill holes into the bone these holes we call them micro fractures they are very tiny every um the diameter of every hole you see here is about 0 0.9 millimeter and they would uh help the the uh, stem cells as you can see over here by the bleeding to come out of the joint these stem cells would then build a new cartilage layer it would take several months to happen but over time it would build a new cartilage layer and you can see this is a second look after we did the microfracture and the prp you can see how there is a new cartilage that occupied that area that had only bone we still call it a second grade cartilage it's not as good as the cartilage we were born with but it's definitely better than not having cartilage at all and it can support good level of activity uh, basically at any age sometimes when the cartilage is not good enough and we cannot trust the stem cells we we may add allograft cartilage and we're going to implement that and add some fibro fibro um, glue on top of it to keep it in place and that would grow and mimic more the cartilage we were born with but it's a much more complicated procedure you can see here a patient this is an mri of a patient that had significant cartilage damage and subchondral cystic changes and in these cases we have to um, fill in the cyst the same way we fill a cavity in the teeth with a dentist we have to fill it with bone in order to make sure that it would heal well and you can see an mri that came six months later how that whole area now is completely healed because we were arthroscopically filling that bone you can see how it happens in real life we first locate the cyst that we saw on the mri we pull out of the cyst all the liner and the soft tissue that grew inside and we uh, prepare that for bone graft then outside of the body we fill the bone graft inside the delivery device and that delivery device then arthroscopically in a medium of water as you can see would fill that hole and you can see in dry condition without fluid how the bone is now filling the area and afterwards we can go off traction and we can start the healing process now we also have to understand though that in order to do everything that we do here we have to distract the hip joint we have to pull on the leg in order to get enough space to work safely within the hip joint the way it was traditionally done uh, up until uh, recently or still in some cases 
would be to generate that counter force when we pull on the leg in order to make sure the patient would not fly off the bed via a perineal post, that huge padded post that you can see here that is sitting between the patient's legs. So we would pull on one leg and then the other leg would um, basically be the counter force around the groin of the patient. And then we sometimes apply up to 100, sometimes even more than 100 pounds of force, sometimes for hours until we fix our way to fix inside the hip joint. But quite fast, and we're talking about a couple of decades back, as this surgery became more and more popular and more surgeons were doing it around the world, there were a lot of complications were associated with that technique because as we pull against the groin, and again, with significant amount of force, we start seeing significant amount of neuropraxias. Neuro a lot of patients suffered from numbness and um, inability to sustain erection on orgasm and they had scrotal necrosis or vaginal tears because of that perineal post forced against them. And that caused us about 10 years ago to develop a new technique in a new bed that eliminates the need for that pole. There's thousands around the world using our technique that developed here, which is a completely postless or post-free bed that enables us to go into the hip joint and do the exact same type of work, but we are not using a post anymore. So we have not been using a post for the past 5,000 hip scopes. And obviously because of that, we have zero complication around this area. Obviously that technology uh, won many awards over years. And as I said, now it's the gold standard around the world for doing hip arthroscopy. However, let's dive a little bit deeper. We talked about hip impingement, but that's only one small problem out of the main issue uh, that we see usually when patients come with hip pain. You can see here that on the right side, we see a normal hip. The head is covered well, and the roof of the head or the acetabulum is sitting nicely close to horizontal around the femoral head. And this uh, bl blue line that you can see, what we call the Shenton line, is not broken. However, when we look on the left side, we can see a Shenton line that is broken because the femoral head starts to sublux or move upwards away from the hip socket because there is such an inclination and shallow socket. We call that hip dysplasia. And when surgeon starts to do a hip scope only to try to fix the labrum tear and hip dysplasia, these failed colostally very, very fast. This was something that we learned quite early in the course of hip arthroscopy uh, world. And then we started under, sorry, understanding that there is not only FAI that we have to address, it also a form of hip instability, which is a combination of the bony and the soft tissue part within the hip joint. The bone is obviously how the hip socket and the femur are sitting and what's the anatomy like. The soft tissue is how the muscle, the tendon, the capsule, the ligaments enables us to move. And these two, if they are over a certain threshold, would cause dysplasia, whether frank or borderline. We usually start by examining the patient to see if they are lax or not. There are some patients which tend to be more flexible than others. Sometimes we think that flexibility is something that can develop over time, but it's inherent characteristic of the human body. If someone can move their elbow past the straight line or the knee past the straight line, we give them points for that Baton score. And if they have six out of nine points or more, we call them hyperlax. Now, when we talk about the bony part of it, you can sh see that the shallow socket would give rays for the hip joint to come out for the femur to start subluxing. And that's what causes that same hip joint that I showed you before to become, to go from a normal hip joint with a good joint space, a good cartilage to a hip joint that need a hip replacement. We can see a lot of that as clues when we examine the patient. If someone have extreme range of motion more than others, that would suggest the head, that the head of the femur is too loose and we need to take care of that. And we can do that in the clinic. Many times when we examine the patients correctly and we document that, we can, even without seeing the x-ray, understand if someone is leaning more towards the impingement or more towards the instability side of things. There is other aspect, which is a bit more complicated, which relates to how the femur itself, meaning the bone that goes from the hip joint to the knee is sitting within the hip socket. Sometimes it loops too much to the front or too much to the back, and that also can affect the pain and the different pathology that we need to address. We call it the too much head sign. If someone can move so much, if they have 60 degrees of range of motion, which is uh, obviously abnormal, the normal is around 15 to 20, it means that the head can pop out of the front. 
and that would cause obviously labral tear, cartilage damage, and would end up as, a, as a arthritis if you're not going to fix it. Now, if someone has such a significant femoral abnormality, even if they have cam lesion, like we said that we see before and we treated, it wouldn't even come into play. So we talk about so many different factors here, so many different parameters, and we have to assess all of them, put them all into some sort of an equation when we decide what will be the best treatment option for each patient that we see. When we look at the socket itself, sometimes it may look almost normal on X-ray, but you can see there is very small area which actually covers the head in the front. In this part, the socket in the front is deficient. Sometimes the anatomy of the socket has what we call an upsloping sourcil. In this respect, the head would start subluxing out because it's not congruent. The femoral head doesn't sit nicely inside. When we look at the MRI, we can see if they have small or large labrum. A large labrum would usually signify hip instability because they try to compensate for the lack of enough of bone. You can see that when we go into the hip joint, we see a large labrum. For us, it would tell right away that patient is dysplastic, even if the X-ray and MRI didn't show it right away. Sometimes there is significant cartilage thickness that develops over time as a compensatory mechanism with patients with dysplasia. And now when we have all of these different parameters, the 3D CAT scan, the CAT scan, the MRI, the X-ray, we can say that we have the history behind us, we have the exam, we have the imaging, we can come up with a conclusion what to do. So this patient is clearly dysplastic. The head, which you can see here, was supposed to cover in full, but only that small part of the head in blue is actually come into contact with the hip socket. That is not a hip that's gonna survive for many years unless it's gonna be fixed. So what is the fix? We call it PAO, or periacetabular osteotomy. This is a surgery, a very uh, significant surgery, where we intentionally rotate part of the pelvis in order to cover the head a little bit better. The main two um, techniques that were used in order to conduct this surgery back in the day were the people from England and the Gans or the Bernese from Switzerland. Each one was doing the work quite well, but they had a lot of drawbacks. About 10 years ago, I trained doing both of these, and after seeing the pros and cons of each one, I basically developed a new technique called the CUPAO, which is now being utilized by many surgeons around the world. And that technique basically takes the best out of both worlds, trying to eliminate the disadvantages. It results in a more stable construct after you cut and rotate it. It's a much safer to the sciatic nerve and it enables a much faster rehab with much better aesthetics, and we're gonna show that. So this is the guns, the red line, and you can see that in order to cut the ischium in the bottom, you have to come from the front all the way, and for that you have to have a very large incision relatively, and you cut in an area where you can do it, bl you do it blindly without seeing the sciatic nerve all the way to that black line. Then you have to come from the front and, and connect these two cuts, the problem is that the sciatic nerve lays just about half an inch from there. And because you're doing it blindly without seeing the nerve, if you hit too hard with the osteotome, you may damage the nerve, you may stress the nerve, which is something that in some areas where people were not too experienced caused significant damage in a obviously very healthy patients. With our technique, with the CUPO, we come from the back and then we can go all the way up where you see where that blue line ends, and when we connect it from the top, we are far away from the nerve. So you can see how it's being done in real life. We go to the sciatic nerve, as you can see here with the black asterisk, we can move it away and we can see it and hold it and protect it when we cut the uh, bone at that same area. So it's very, very safe. Then we can put the patient back on their back because we started um, on the side. And after we cut this area, we basically complete the cut from the front, but we have a very small part that we now have to complete from the front and we are very far away from the nerve, so it's much, much safer. It also enables us a much stronger construct and a much more stable because it's an interlocking osteotomy. It basically click into place. So after we did that, we just, you can see it over here in real surgery, we move it, you can see the position of bone by these two sides of the bone seen here by the blue uh, arrows. And then we just put three or four screws and you can see the patient is now ready to go. Now the CUPO as opposed to the traditional gansostotomy has a much smaller incision, which is always concealed by the bikini line or by the underwear line. 
Sometimes to that, we have to also add a femoral osteotomy, as you can see, because the femur itself, as I said, is rotated either too much at the front or too much at the back. And it's a very delicate uh, sort of decision-making uh, process that we have to understand exactly what to do. And that's why we use so many different type of imaging and physical exam findings, you know, to decide what would be the best thing. So you can see here that patient needed both a scope in the beginning to fix the um, cartilage and the labrum and resect cam lesion, then a PAO and a derotational osteotomy to fix all of the different parts of the problems. We usually do it uh, in two stages. First, we do the arthroscopy in order to address the label tears, the cam impingement, microfracture, or grafting of the cysts, as I showed you. Then we like the patient to go home and to start biking immediately, up to a half an hour a day to drive the water out of the joint. We use up to 20 liter during hip arthroscopy, and we want the bleeding from the labral repair and the cam resection to be driven out of the joint, so the joint is completely dry for the second part of the procedure. Otherwise, there is significant amount of adhesions that can develop within the hip joint. And you can see uh, this is a patient only six and eight months, uh, six and nine months after PAO, both sides. And you can see how patients can go to higher level of activity, basically every level of activity. And if there is no microfracture, it would put the patient for six weeks non-weight bearing. They are walking immediately after the PAO and they are allowed to start hiking and light jogging about three to four months after surgery, even so it seems like a very large surgery. It's very stable and it healed quite fast. By five to six months, most patients have uh, the ability to go to unrestricted activity. Sometimes it can take much longer. Obviously, we do these surgeries anywhere from 12 years old to 60 years old. So there is major variability in how fast patients can heal and get back to their activities. Also during hip preservation uh, procedures, and sometimes in conservative measures, we use a lot of platelet-rich plasma or biologics. We use it in non-surgical indications like arthritis when we cannot help them anymore with surgeries, or during surgery itself like in AVN, or during hip scope after we do microfracture and want to promote faster healing of the cartilage, or sometimes after surgery too. We actually uh, published that a few years ago. We did a randomized trial to look how patients are doing after getting both hyaluronic acid, which is a well-accepted treatment, and PRP. And we showed that PRP did, uh, patient with PRP did much, much better than patient that received hyaluronic acid. And you can see that uh, very few patients after PRP had to convert into total hip replacement after several years, as opposed to much more patients after hyaluronic acid. And uh, PRP also gave patients increasing range of motion while they kept on degenerating and get lower range of motions with hyaluronic acid. When we inject PRP, we can inject it into the hip joint itself, but we can also inject it in the subchondral bone to get a much stronger effect of the PRP for a longer time frame. Now, patients who have AVN, and you can see over here that area, are patients that usually, whether were exposed to steroids, they have different types of anemias, or they were scuba diving for a long time, or they are um, using a lot of alcohol. Usually these patients have some sort of a slow death of the femoral head because of the closure of the blood vessels. In these cases, we have to relieve the stress um, within the um, femoral head. And we do that by doing what we call core decompression, where we drill even during scope, or we do it from the outside, not during the scope, if there's not any other indication to get inside. And for that, we also add PRP sometimes or bone MAC, uh, bone marrow aspiration, in order to heal that area. You can see the tracts of that uh, treatment um, here by these fluoroscopy shots from the uh, surgery itself. Now, but in some cases, the arthritic status is just too advanced for us to attempt any sort of preservation procedure. Um, whether the patient is a bit too old for that or whether the patient goals do not justify such significant rehab that happens or that requires sometimes after hip preservation procedure. And in these cases, um, I would lead you now to talk to my partner, Dr. Jessica Lee, that uh, does hip preservation surgery and hip reconstruction. Jessica. Thank you. Thanks, Omer. Hi, everybody. My name is Dr. Jessica Lee. Um, I've had the absolute privilege of training with Dr. May Dan for the past uh, two and a half years, really, uh, starting in 2020, learning all the surgeries that he talked about and training with him in a very high volume capacity. Prior to that, I did an adult reconstruction fellowship, so doing hip and knee replacement surgeries. And then I did uh, the rest of my training in the Midwest, uh, Wright State for orthopedic residency, 
Indiana for school and for uh, undergrad. And there's me, the shortest member of the hip preservation team. So at this point of the lecture, um, Dr. Maydan has gone into a lot of detail discussing all, all different kinds of hip, uh, hip pathology and some of the symptoms that patients present with. Um, but here's some of the questions that um, you may have heard if you're a provider or uh, maybe you're asking yourself at this point if you've lived with hip pain for a very long time. So these questions are, if I had hip dysplasia, why wasn't it caught earlier? And if I've had hip dysplasia my entire li adult life or FAI, why is it bothering me now? Why am I suffering from those symptoms now? Why do I have to fix it now? And what does it take to make hip reservation surgery successful? And then to that point, why not just get a hip replacement? So I'll answer uh, all these questions. So in terms of why now, uh, when we think about people with hip uh, dysplasia, adult hip dysplasia tends to fly under the radar because it was never bad enough to be caught early. We think about babies wearing pavlic harnesses or in spike casting. We think about babies whose hips dislocate easily and relocate easily. Um, and babies do not make their walking milestones early on. But for the babies whose hips don't frankly dislocate or uh, they have what some people refer to as micro instability, they can live for a very long time with hip dysplasia and get to a high level of function without necessarily presenting um, with dislocations and other symptoms like that. And what we find when we talk to patients who have um, hip pathology, a lot of times these symptoms, it's not really about now. These symptoms have actually existed for much longer than the decision to do something about it, often for multiple years. I would say at least five years on average for a lot of our patients. Uh, to that point, why now? Um, sometimes it comes for, well, people suffer through pain and uh, through their circumstances and anatomy for a lot of different reasons. Some of it has to do with patient perception of pain. Some of it can be this coping pattern for many years where it was never really bad enough to do something about it. Uh, maybe it wasn't the right time to do anything. A lot of people who are, are high-level athletes are in the middle of a collegiate or high school um, athletic career. Maybe there are recruiters who are recruiting for D1 sports. Maybe there are people who are wanting to do professional teams for rock climbing or for uh, things like running um, and ballet dancing, things that require a higher amount of flexibility to excel at whatever the sport is. Um, the other part of it, too, is that people need to be really active to experience symptoms associated with hip dysplasia and FAI. So, um, you know, if you're someone who's sedentary and you have hip dysplasia, maybe you won't declare, maybe the um, symptoms that people experience are not going to be as um, profound as someone who's using their hips and being very active on a daily basis. And it's often a self-fulfilling prophecy, you know, sometimes a lot of high-level ballet dancers, rock climbers, people who do martial arts and gymnastics, um, these are inherently sports that require a lot of flexibility. So people who have hip dysplasia, because they can lift their legs so high, um, will often self-select to do these activities which are inherently destructive to their hip joints over a period of time. There are a lot of professional ballet dancers, for example, who get what we consider to be premature hip replacements, meaning hip replacements before the age of 50 after a full professional career of dancing. And their lifespan isn't long in, term, in terms of that career. And then the kind of last aspect of that is that as athletes and people in general age, your ability to compensate or um, recover from the damage that's inflicted by the insult of doing a lot of activity with hip dysplasia anatomy starts to drop off as you get a little bit older. So you can't cope with it quite as well as you could when you were in your early 20s or teens. Um, the next side of this is why is it so important to fix bad hip anatomy now? You know, you've lived with this uh, for a very long time, so why do you have to fix it? Um, well, number one, if you're at the point where you're asking this question, probably you've suffered for a very long time and maybe that suffering is to the point where you can no longer do the stuff that you like to do. Your pain actually stops you from continuing in the sport. Um, the other part of it is that you are continuing to do damage by doing that sport if you have symptoms and damage to the inside of your hip joint already. So early intervention, if you have a good joint that's viable, can still delay or prevent the onset of hip arthritis. And this is actually a really important factor because this is the difference between needing a hip replacement and maintaining your own hip joint. So that's a really big, big deal for someone who's active and young. Um, we find too in our studies that hip dysplasia is the most common cause for people to have a hip replacement before the age of 40, meaning they've worn out their joint prematurely because they have bad anatomy. And the PAO surgery, if you intervene early enough, can take you to a point where maybe you don't need a hip replacement in your lifetime, or maybe you can push off having a hip replacement to a later age. Um, once we push this age group out into the uh, 50, 40s to 50s age, over half the people who get uh, hip replacement under the age of 50 as opposed to 40 are because they had untreated hip dysplasia that went on for too far long.
So what does it take to make a hip preservation surgery successful? First of all, you have to have the right diagnosis so you know which problem you're treating. Like Dr. Maidan had alluded to, it's not just about the labral tear. Hip pain is often complex. Uh, there are a lot of red herrings in diagnosis. People tend to harp on the labral tear. They get an MRI, someone tells them they have a labral tear and they need to fix the labral tear. But it's not just about that, it's just the tip of the iceberg. So proper diagnosis is key to improving symptoms. A hip scope, if you just fix the labral tear, that's not gonna fix the problems because it doesn't fix the root cause. So uh, you not only have to fix the labral tear, the synovitis you, and the capsule um, or the ligamentum teres, you have to fix the reason why the hip pathology on the inside of the hip joint uh, occurred in the first place. And sometimes on the flip side of that, if you get a hip scope and you never treat the underlying cause, if your joint is sort of on the edge of um, uh, rapid destruction or turning into bad arthritis to the point where you, only need a, you can only get a hip replacement, uh, the hip scope is enough stress to your hip joint that it can actually make your symptoms worse if the main reason that caused the damage is not addressed. So here are two x-rays. Uh, the person on the top x-ray, this is a person who also has a labral tear. The person on the bottom also has uh, a labral tear, but these are two very different looking hips on what we call the done view uh, and two very different patterns of damage on just the x-rays. So the person on top um, doesn't have a lot of what we consider to be impingement where Dr. Medan had that uh, nice diagram with the, the cam lesion in flames. Um, and you see not a whole lot of impingement with this hip, but this is a person who had hip dysplasia. So not only did they need the scope, but they needed the PAO to fix all of the problems. And then the person on the bottom had pretty much straightforward um, impingement pathology. So both have labral tears, both got labral tears fixed, two very different reasons. What else does it take to make hip preservation surgery successful? It takes a good team. So like many uh, elective orthopedic surgeries, the surgery itself is not the end of the overall treatment that uh, the patient has to go through. So good physical therapy is key to success after hip preservation surgery to regain motion, to progress activities and strength as people start the healing process, not, from, uh, not only from a bony standpoint, but from a soft tissue standpoint. And in addition to that, because hip pathology is so complex and exists with things like spine pathology, with SI joint pathology and pelvic floor pathology, a lot of people have lived with a, a whole cadre of symptoms for a very long time that coexist simultaneously. So um, sometimes if you have these overlapping symptoms, it requires other providers and specialists to take a look at the patients and examine them and rule out not only primary but secondary pathologies. So these people might be PM&R specialists, sports medicine specialists, spine specialists, and sometimes urogynecologists and pelvic floor specialists. A lot of people who have hip pathology um, also have concomitant issues like dysuria or painful urination as well as uh, painful sexual activity. So these are obviously very big deals for people's lifestyles. So this kind of uh, gets to a national, natural progression of when is enough enough, meaning when does hip preservation not work anymore? Um, how many scopes does someone go through before they uh, can no longer benefit from hip preservation surgery? You have to have a couple of things that uh, make hip preservation surgery work in addition to what I'd already mentioned, but sometimes the hip joint is too far gone. Um, and that's when the person is at the end of an arthritic process, uh, despite the desire to continue with impact uh, activities, things like running and uh, weightlifting, CrossFit, stuff like that, um, extreme downhill skiing. So this is an x-ray of a 34-year-old male, very active rock climber, runner, um, and was a triathlete. However, um, despite the age of 34, you can see on his left hip there um, that there's basically no joint space at the at at the edge of the joint, he's got a big osteophyte or bone spur that's wrapping around his femoral head. So the ball is no longer ball shaped, it's more egg shaped. Um, but it's, this is not a cam, this is a result of arthritis. Um, so this is someone who did well with a kind of hip replacement type surgery, which is called the resurfacing arthroplasty. So even though the activities matched hip preservation, the joint unfortunately did not match. So this person did not get a hip preservation surgery and would not have done well with a hip preservation surgery. Um, the other reason to do it on the flip side of this some people, the joint matches, but the activity and uh, demands and expectations don't match. So some people cannot go through the recovery of something like a PAO surgery because of time, financial, logistical constraints, and a hip replacement in that case may be better for that patient. So you have to match the patient with the pathology and the treatment with the patient. Uh, continuing on that limb, this is kind of what um, a really bad end-stage arthritic process where there's collapse of the joint would look like. So things like AVN and stage arthritis can change that. 
And also um, this would match someone who's a little bit lower demand, people who um, aren't necessarily runners or triathletes um, and they've made their peace with not running anymore after a long lifetime career of doing that. So they're okay with having an artificial joint. So that's an okay option too for the right person. Um, it is really good surgery. It is the gold standard surgery for a treatment of painful symptoms and loss of function associated with end-stage hip disease. And it does have extremely high long-term patient satisfaction. So this is a very good surgery for people who don't have a good joint anymore. Uh, the last thing that I kind of want to mention here is that um, just because you have a hip uh, replacement surgery doesn't fix all of your problems if you have some of this coexistent pathology, the extra articular pain, things like gluteus medius or abductor tears, things like hamstring tears and hip flexor injuries. Um, if these are secondary pathologies to having primary hip pathology, the um, some of the pain may improve once you do something like a hip replacement surgery or even hip preservation surgery. However, you still have to fix uh, the problem if there's damage there. So this is an x-ray of a 70-year-old very athletic uh, downhill skier who was um, very extremely active skied at, at got like you know 100 days out on snow every year consistently and he had a very nice looking hip resurfacing arthroplasty um, however his function was not good so the x-rays look great but the function was not good so in this case uh, we did an MRI of this patient and you can see uh, you don't have to be a doctor to see that there's a very big difference between the two hips the right hip, you can see the abductors, the muscle looks good. This guy has just made a muscle and bones, um, and maybe some skin thrown in there too. But um, the muscle looks really good. There's no degeneration. You can just see on the left side that there's a big white void from where the abductors are supposed to attach to a part of the bone called the greater trochanter. However, they are detached here. And on the right side, you can see where they're attached. There's that little black wavy line that shows the tendon itself um, attached to the greater trochanter on the opposite side. So this guy ended up getting an abductor tear and then he was able to go back to skiing once he was fully re rehabbed from that and was very happy on that hip for a very long time. Still happy with that hip. The bottom line is that uh, you need the right surgery for you. Patients need the right surgery for them. That surgery could be hip preservation or it could be hip reconstruction. Both of them are good options, but it has to be the right surgery for the right patient. So all patients who get hip surgery need a comprehensive hip and pelvis workup to understand the source and cause of their painful hip and to choose the best, best treatment strategy for them. And they need a specialist to help them get all the information to make that decision. Um, this last image that I'm closing on here is a picture of a 34 year old um, nurse who was previously a professional dancer. She uh, wanted to get hip preservation surgery on both of her hips, but unfortunately um, she'd made the decision um, for uh, sorry, I said that wrong. The, uh, unfortunately, her right hip was not good from a joint standpoint, meaning she had cysts, she had too much arthritis. So her joint wasn't a good qualifier for hip preservation surgery. So she ended up getting a total hip replacement. However, since she was 34 and still really active, and she had a good chance of having a good joint for her left side, she elected to go to, P to a PAO surgery subsequent to having the total hip done, and is very happy with both hips at this day. So, um, you know, Everyone is very different in terms of how they present in their treatment options, but uh, bottom line is you need a comprehensive workup to figure out what's best for you. Thank you from the hip preservation team, and I think Wendy is up next to uh, take questions. Dr. Maidan, would you please describe the most difficult case that you have ever treated? I don't know how uh, of a teachable moment would that be, but there is some pathologies out there which are not common. Uh, some patients with uh, protes or with uh, scaphy, which are different type of uh, pediatric slash adolescence type of hip pathologies that also result in impingement and dysplasia. But in these cases, it's you have to go through three very complex surgeries uh, combined. The hip scope is, where mo is way more uh, challenging because it's very hard to go into the joint and the joint itself, anatomically speaking, is not normal. So you have to deal with that. And then the femoral osteotomy is usually used um, to be done with a plate because a nail cannot even fit inside. So there's a lot of different types of challenges in the way you cut the femur and rotate it. 
And then the PAO, uh, again, a lot of, uh, in these cases, the anatomy is not the normal type of anatomy we do in, in the 100 PAOs that we do a year. And it's becoming way more complex in terms of the pre-planning and the judgment during the surgery itself. How to execute basically what we planned. And we try to be obviously extremely precise and scientific that we always match our pre-plan to what we execute during surgery. The next question is, uh, after getting the corrections with DF, O and PAO, would movements such as the splints or high impact sports potentially cause issues in the hips once again? So if the surgery is being done correctly, a uh, hip scope and a PAO in a young patient that did not have yet arthritic changes in the hip joint and were able to modify and correct the anatomy, that patient should be able to do everything pain-free. However, there is a caveat to that because a lot of patients, as Dr. Lee mentioned before, are self-selected to their sports because they are dysplastic. So if you're a ballet dancer and you're a dysplastic, you are able to uh, bring your hip into a certain range of motion, which is in a way abnormal to most people, but obviously helps you to perform the way you want to. Once we do a PAO, the patient does not have pain and they feel more stable, but at the same time, they have to lose some range of motion. So we have to understand that in some instances, this is a trade-off. When we give the hip more stability, we have in return to take some range of motion. Jess, do you want to elaborate on that? Uh, no, I mean, I think we explained to people that inherently uh, PAO correction and BFO corrections will change their anatomy so their range of motion is not going to be as high. Some people can get back to doing splits, but sometimes people will lose that ability. It depends on the person and depends on how much correction they need because our main goal is to get them back to um, high function and pain, uh, less pain. It's the flip side of that. If a patient, for instance, needs an FAI surgery because he has come impingement, we had a lot of patients that um, increased, were able to increase the range of motion because we removed some of the bone that prevented them from being able to flex the hip all the way in. So some of these surgeries enables you to get more range of motion and be able to perform better. Some of them have to take some range of motion uh, in return to becoming more stable and patients sometimes needs to adapt their techniques, whether it's climbing technique, skiing technique, running technique, to their new anatomy, which is pain-free, but with uh, slightly less range of motion in some instances. Thank you. What is heterotopic ossification? Can it happen with his re hip replacement surgery? Um, Any time that there is muscular damage or um, a lot of burring of bone or bone fragments that are created if they're not irrigated, um, and especially with muscle damage too, that can calcify and turn into heterotopic ossification. Sometimes if you cut a bone end, that can turn into heterotopic ossification. There are certain medications that we give people like naproxen. Um, and certain techniques that we implement to lessen the chance of getting heterotopic ossification. But it's just kind of extra um, ossification that exists subsequent to a surgery. Thank you. This question's a little specific, but let's ask it. Would you recommend PRP for a very active 60-year-old recent acute labral tear with associated F a I pincher type or PT or surgery? Do you want to answer that? Sure. You know, not having seen this person's joint status, meaning not being able to comment on whether there is cartilage loss or damage, um, it depends on what phase of the decision making process they're in. Um, PRP is a really good biologic agent that doesn't create any additional degeneration within the joint. So I'd say it's worth, pun intended, a shot 
to see, um, or really in our case, three is our preference, um, to see if that takes away some of the painful inflammatory symptoms that are associated with FAI pincer pathology or any other impingement pathology. But it won't fix the pincer. It won't take the pincer away. It won't fix the labral tear. It won't fix the FAI um, cam type either. It just helps to decrease the uh, inflammatory symptoms that exist within the hip joint. The problem is that when we are dealing with patients, as Dr. Lee said before, we have to consider a lot of different factors and the age is one of these factors. So if you treat a 25 years old patients with let's say the exact same X-ray, pincer morphology of FAI and labral tear, the PRP can give them maybe a year, maybe two of pain relief, even so, as Dr. Lee said, it would not fix the problem. It would just basically put it, you know, um, in a way that it wouldn't bother the patient as they are active. But at that age, you wouldn't burn any bridges. If someone over the age of 45, 50 would have PRP instead of surgery, they may close their window of opportunity to have surgery and to fix and preserve that joint. So if you're uh, around 55, 60 years old, and now you're gonna have PRP, it may help you for several years, but there is a very good chance that once you're done with PRP, hip replacement would be the second option or the next option because you probably would not be a valid candidate anymore for hip preservation surgery. The next question is, what degree of flexibility is bad flexibility, even after getting these surgeries in terms of range of motion? I think this question's about. That's not really a question that we can answer um, away, taking away from the individual patient. Um, everyone's body moves differently. Their soft tissues act differently. They have, like what Dr. Maydan was talking about, their bait and scores may allow for more tissue, um, t tissue mobility that can create more flexibility for certain individuals. So it really just depends on the person to determine what uh, knocks them over to the point of being pathologic versus being acceptable. Yeah, it's important to emphasize that the hip preservation field is as far as you can get from a one size fits all. Every patient move and look uh, and function very differently. It's much easier many times with the knee or the shoulder to be able to say something very conclusive without examining the patient on so many different levels. It's not the same with the hip and pelvis. It's a very deep joint with a lot of um, different structures around a very complex anatomy, a lot of mimickers from the spine or other tendons and nerves around. So physical exam is the hallmark of trying to understand what bothers the patients and what do we need to do in order to take that pain away. But like, if you can put your leg behind your head and that hurts, that's probably too far. What is the average, you probably covered this and, and this, uh, Guess guest says that it's probably difficult to answer, but what is the average recovery time for hip replacement versus the average preservation procedures? Um, well, the, that person was right. It depends on the surgery, but probably what they're asking is the comparison between hip replacement surgery and PAO surgery or DFO surgery. Um, depending on the joint status, these are all surgeries that enable people to weight bear right away. Um, and I think people can enjoy a higher level of function after hip replacement surgery, meaning they can do more early on in the first two to six weeks, uh, meaning they can walk a little bit without pain. And they still probably require crutches or a walker as an ambulatory aid during that phase but they don't quite have so much pain because they don't have a big void of bone that they have to fill in, uh, like someone with a PAO surgery would need or someone with a derotational osteotomy would require. Um, and the gait training, I think, isn't quite as involved as it would be for rearranging someone's anatomy. It's important to understand that hip replacement is usually much better on the 
uh, front end because it's a faster surgery with faster recovery. You basically take everything that is torn or bad in the joint and throw it to the garbage and put a fake hip instead. But it would have a lot of shortcomings with regards to the highest level of activity or main uh, athletic goals that patients want to achieve. While doing hip preservation surgery would require on the front end more time and recovery, and there is major variability here, I'll elaborate on that in a second, but it would not have any restrictions once you fully heal. It would take longer, but then you can go and do whatever you want to do, even at a higher level of activity than you had before surgery. Now, because we do these surgeries on patients which are adolescents, but at the same time, we do it all the way to patients which are 55 or 60 years old, and obviously everything in between. Some patients which are very young, uh, you know, in their um, early 20s, can go back to um, play sports and, and run even, you know, marathons within four or five months, while it would take twice that time for patients 45, 50, or 60 years old. So if you are really young, we would see patients uh, 12, 15 years old after PAO walking without crutches after six weeks because they are fully healed. You would never see that happening with a patient 50 or 60 years old. So there is major variability on how patients do also because of their age, their athletic level, their muscle balance, their muscle volume, what was their activity level before. You cannot take a professional athlete that play uh, for his livelihood and compare them and they need to do PT and they can do PT for five hours a day with a PT that sits next to them as opposed to a normal human being that has to go to work and can spend only 30 minutes doing PT after surgery. Thank you. Is your practice one a patient would come to after seeing a less specialized orthopedic doctor first or is it appropriate for a patient with hip pain to seek treatment with your group from the beginning? We see everything. Um, we, are, we are considered as a national, even global referral center. So major part of our patients are flying in from, you know, across the nation and sometimes from out, out of the country, obviously without a referral from a local PCP or orthopedic surgeon. The same within Colorado, patients can approach us um, and set a, sch a scheduled visit directly, or they can do it via uh, their um, primary care or, or different orthopedic surgeon. There is not like any specific way. Um, they can just go and see you, hipclinic.com, which is um, a way to get to us, or they can approach us in any other way. And we'll see patients for original evaluation that didn't see anyone or patients that uh, were referred by physical therapists or by other physicians. We have time for just a couple more questions here. Um, what sport or activity would you frown upon the most after having all three of these surgeries or any of these three surgeries? None, I mean, the whole point is to get people back to doing what they like doing. Um, yeah. I, once, I once someone is fully healed, there is not any sport that we would restrict on doing. That's why hip preservation is very different than hip replacement. Um, hip replacement is a great surgery to take the pain away, and it obviously fits a lot of uh, different people. But you don't want to be climbing El Capitan and somewhere fifteen hundred feet up to dislocate your hip and to be stuck on the wall. Um, with hip preservation surgery, once everything is fully healed, you can do whatever you want to do with no restrictions. There's no issues whatsoever. It doesn't matter what type of activity, what level of activity, and where. Thank you. 